Terry Minutes, nummer 1606, met een uitzending voor vandaag, 28 april 2019. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. Today's bulletin will be for the major part in English, but I will start first with some info for our Dutch listeners. De afgelopen dagen had ze geen uitzending, de afgelopen twee dagen zelfs. Ik dacht vrijdag dat ik spanningshoofdpijn had. Inmiddels denk ik dat ik een lichte voorhoofdsholteontsteking gehad heb. Ik heb dat eerder gehad en vooral vandaag en in minder mate gisteren leek het erop. Hoe dan ook, in de loop van vandaag zondag ging het een stuk beter. Ik wilde op de gewone tijd de daily minutes maken en ik besloot om voor de tijd nog wat te eten. Ik had namelijk makkelijk te eten of makkelijk te bereiden eten in huis. Enfin, ik ben dus na het eten in slaap gevallen en ik werd om zeven uur wakker van de beginmuziek van de daily minutes. Want uh, dmr.li stond nog aan. Deze uitzending zal dus voor het eerst lopen vanaf 10 uur zondagavond. Geen data in de uitzending, maar wel het RSGB nieuws van TX Factor met daarna de column van Onno. Omdat we gisteren geen uitzending hadden, heb ik daarna ook het ARRL Audio News. En daarna is er nog een aflevering van de Doctors in, ook van de ARRL. Deze uitzending gaat over de steeds uitgebreider wordende portofoons van tegenwoordig. And now the English part of our broadcast. Podcast. Uh, this is our bulletin for Sunday, 28 April 2019. We didn't have a daily minutes last two days because of some minor health problems on my side. This broadcast will only run as of 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. on Sunday evening. I skipped the 7 p.m. time slot because I fell asleep shortly before HI. This bulletin has no data, but it does have the RGB bulletin in the version of TX Factor. After that, there's Ono VK6 FLAB with his foundations column. I believe it is about SDR. Then we have the ARRL audio news and we close today's broadcast with ARRL's The Doctor is In, which handles small handheld transceivers and their ever-increasing number of functions, as it seems. Hello, this is Mike Marsh, G1IAR, and welcome to the TX News podcast of the GB2RS National News for Sunday the 28th of April 2019, supplied by the Radio Society of Great Britain and brought to you by TX Factor. The news headlines this week, RSGB at IARU Region 1 Interim Meeting, RSGB ARDF Championships next weekend, and could you volunteer to support amateur radio? The IARU Region 1 Interim Meeting is being held this weekend, the 27th and the 28th of April, in Vienna. It's a key opportunity for national societies to consider changes and opportunities across at HF, VHF, Microwave and EMC matters. The RSGB has been a major contributor of inputs to the overall total of 70 papers and will have representatives in all three topics. The inputs can be found on the meeting website over at vienna.iaru-r1.org. The first bank holiday weekend sees the annual three-day RSGB ARDF championships taking place in the Thames Valley. The areas chosen are Christmas Common near Wendover, Whiteleaf near Prince's Risborough and Hodgemore Woods near Amersham. Now at this time of year the forests in this country are at their best, the weather's reasonably warm and the nettles, brambles and bracken are not yet fully developed. We're welcoming small groups from Romania and the Czech Republic this year to add an international flavour to the weekend. The competitions will comprise classic ARDF events on 144 megahertz megahertz and 3.5 megahertz on two of the days with the final day devoted to the two short format variants. These both use the 3.5 megahertz band and are Fox a ring where the location of each transmitter is marked by a circle on the map. The transmitter is extremely low power, typically around 30 milliwatts, which is only audible when the computer gets close to the circle. DF is then used to actually find it inside or close by the circle. The second is a sprint race with a total of 10 3.5 MHz transmitters operating on two frequencies, five transmitters on each frequency. The top competitors will be coming back in about 20 minutes, having located all 10 transmitters. Needless to say, the transmitters are quite close to each other, and there's more information available on the ARDF pages of the RSGB website, and late entries are possible. 
There are a number of volunteer vacancies available within the RSGB right now. These range from district regional representatives who work with clubs and individuals within part of one of the 13 regions to the role of Beyond Exams champion. Beyond Exams is a suite of initiative designed to promote engagement, learning and enjoyment in amateur radio for all and someone is needed to look after the schemes under this banner. If you think you'd like to volunteer within the hobby of amateur radio, go over to rsgb.org slash volunteers. Joe Taylor, Kilo One Juliet Tango has announced a new digital mode, FT4, which is two and a half times faster than FT8 and is an experimental digital mode designed specifically for radio contesting. FT4 can work with signals 10 dBs weaker than needed for RTTY whilst using much less bandwidth. The message formats are the same as those in FT8 and are encoded with the same low-density parity check code. Transmissions last for 4.48 seconds compared to 12.64 for FT8. If you'd like some more information on the brand new FT4, head over to tinyurl.com forward slash Yankee5YankeeLima66 November Juliet. SOS Radio Week will take place between 0 hundred hours on the 1st of May and 2359 UTC on the 31st of May. This annual event has been extended for 2019 to raise awareness of the amazing work that the brave volunteers of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution perform and to honour the volunteer watchkeepers of the National Coast Watch Institution who provide eyes around the coast of the UK to observe and report potential disasters disasters unfolding that technology cannot. Individual amateur radio operators and clubs are invited to register as official SOS Radio Week stations and operate during the month to raise awareness of the invaluable work these two organisations perform. Stations can be run under individual, club or special event call signs from home or other locations. There are a few restrictions as to what can be done, how or where, other than to warn participants not to operate within the vicinity of a lifeboat or a coast watch station without first clearing it with them to register or to take part or you'd like some more information just go over to the website at sosradioweek.org.uk and the may edition of hack space magazine features amateur radio articles by joe mike whiskey six charlie yankee kilo it's available as a free pdf and you can download it right now from tinyurl.com forward slash yankee three kilo seven nine five Tango 8. That's your headline news this week. Now it's time for details of rallies and events for the upcoming week. Sunday the 28th of April, it's the Northern Amateur Radio Society's Association Exhibition, which will take place at the Norbrecht Castle Exhibition Centre in Blackpool. The postcode, Foxtrot Yankee 2 9 Alpha Alpha. Now there will be a talk-in station and plenty of car parking. Trade stands are on site and a bring and buy. Special interest groups and an RSGB bookstall. The doors open at 10.30 or 10.15 for disabled visitors and there is catering available on site. If you'd like some more information, get in touch with Dave, Mike Zero, Oscar Bravo Whiskey on his landline, which is 01270-761-608. Also on Sunday, the 28th of April, the Andover RAC Spring Car Boot Sale will be held in the Wildern Village Hall near Andover. Postcode is Sierra Papa 110 Juliet Echo. It opens at 10, admission will cost you £2, and there is catering available all day. There's an ample on-site parking scenario and indoor shelter should it be raining. If you'd like some more information, get in touch with Paul, Golf 4 Kilo Zulu Yankee on his mobile, which is 07775 738 200. Next Saturday, the 5th of May, the Thorpe Camp Ham Fest will be taking place at Thorpe Camp Visitor Centre in Tattershall. Postcode there is Lima November 4, Fort Papa Lima. Doors open to the public from 9 in the morning. It'll cost you £4 to get in. Children under 12 get in free. And there's more information in the events page of thorpecamp.org. Or you can call Sylvia or Ant on the mobile, which is 07956 654 481.
And Sunday, the 6th of May, next weekend, sees the 35th Dartmoor Radio Club Rally at the Butchers Hall Pannier Market in Tavistock. Got no postcode this time, but entrance to the rally will be from the square, and doors open at 10 in the morning. Admission will cost you £2. There's traders, a bring and buy, and an RSGB bookstore with refreshments available too. If you'd like some more information, get in touch with Roger, 2 Echo Zero, Romeo Papa Hotel, on his mobile... 07854 or you can drop him an email at 2echo0rph at gmail.com That's it for rallies. Don't forget to get your event into Radcom or onto the RSGB News or on the RSGB website. Please send your details in as early as you possibly can to radcom at rsgb.org.uk. And the print cycle for the Radcom magazine means that we need to know about your rally or event four months in advance to make sure we get it into the next edition. DX News time now from 425 DX News and other sources. Jean-Marc Foxtrot 5, Sierra Golf India will be active as Tango Mike 6. India Lima Echo from Groy Island, which is Echo Uniform 048, until the 4th of May. He'll be operating CW only and all QSLs will be confirmed automatically via the Bureau. Hero, Juliet Foxtrot 1, Oscar Sierra Lima, Toru, Juliet Hotel 0, Charlie, Juliet Hotel, and Chin, Juliet Romeo 1, November Hotel Delta, will be operating as Mike Delta 0, Hotel Whiskey X-Ray, Mike Delta 0, India Tango Papa, and Mike Delta 0, India Uniform X-Ray, respectively, holiday styly from the Isle of Man, which is Echo Uniform 116. They'll be doing that until the 1st of May and they'll be operating SSB, CW and digital modes on the 40 to 10 metre bands and the plans are to upload the logs to Logbook of the World and Club Log. A team of eight Belgian operators will be active as Golf Juliet 6, Echo Foxtrot Whiskey from Jersey, which is Echo Uniform 013 until the 5th of May. They'll operate mainly CW with some CW and FT8 thrown in on the HF bands and 6 metres. QSL via Oscar November 6 Echo Foxtrot Direct or via the Bureau and EQSL. They will not be using Logbook of the World. Parsi Oscar Hotel 3 Whiskey Sierra will be active as Oscar Juliet Zero Whiskey from Market Reef, which is Echo Uniform 053, until the 4th of May. Activity will be limited to his spare time and QSL via the home call, direct or via the bureau. And finally, Jun Juliet Lima 8 Alpha Quebec Hotel will be on the air as X-Ray Victor 9 X-Ray X-Ray from Hu in Vietnam until the 4th of May. Now he hopes to be on 40, 30, 20 and 17 metres and if you get a contact QSL requests go via Club Log OQRS. Next up, it's the special events news, and there's only one of these this week. From the 4th to the 31st of May, Golf Bravo 9 SOS will be operating as part of SOS Radio Week. The station will be operating on as many HF and VHF bands as possible during the 28 days that the station will be active. It'll be operating from 1900 to 2100 weekdays and 900 hours to 1600 hours at the weekends. Further details can be found on the website at doc. CSVRUK, that's docsvruk.com slash golf 8 x ray Quebec Bravo. And please send your special event details to Radcom at RSGB as early as possible for free publicity on GB2RS in Radcom and online. Remember that stations using UK special event call signs must be open to the public, so our free publicity can help make your efforts more widely known. Moving on to contest news now, the SPDX RTTY contest ends its 24-hour run at 1200 UTC on Sunday the 28th using the 3.5 to 28 MHz contest bands, the exchange's signal report and serial number with SP stations sending their province code. 
Sunday the 28th, it's also the BARTG Sprint 75, running from 1700 through to 2100. Using the 3.5 to 28 MHz contest bands, the exchange is serial number. Now, there are no contests in the diary for Monday to Friday for the coming week, but it is a busy weekend over the 4th and the 5th of May. On Saturday the 4th, the 432 MHz Trophy Contest runs 1400 through 2200 UTC. Using all modes, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. The 10 GHz Trophy runs at the same time using all modes and the same contest exchange. The 432 to 248 GHz Trophy Contest runs for 24 hours from 1400 UTC on the 4th to 1400 UTC on the 5th, where using all modes, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. The UK 6 metre group summer marathon starts on the 4th of May and it runs until the 4th of August. Using all modes on the 50 MHz band exchange is just your four character locator. Starting at 1200 UTC on the 4th and running for 24 hours, the ARI International DX Contest uses CW, phone and RTTY on the 3.5 to 28 MHz bands. The exchange is signal report and serial number with Italian stations also sending their province code. Sunday the 5th of May sees the UK Microwave Group contest run from 0800 to 1400 UTC. Using all modes on the 1.3 to 3.4 GHz bands, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. And finally, on Sunday the 5th of May, it's the IRTS 40 Metres Counties Contest and it runs 1200 through 1400 UTC. Using SSB and CW, the exchange is signal report and serial number with Irish stations also sending their county. So, finishing up the main news now, it's the radio propagation report compiled by Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha and Golf 4 Delta Delta Kilo on Friday the 26th of April. Last week saw the start of the sporadic e-season and there were reports of openings on 10 metres and Andy, Mike Zero November Kilo Romeo, even reported working the Gambia on 28 megahertz. This must have been a lucky F2 layer opening, but a contact is still a contact. Signals from the Czech Republic, the Ukraine, Poland, Italy, Spain and the French beacon, Fox 5 Zulu Echo Hotel beacon, on 28.231 MHz were also heard on Thursday the 25th at 1300 UTC. So don't forget that sporadic E can affect all the bands from 20 metres to 10 metres. The best guide may be the 10 metre beacons across Europe which can act as good propagation indicators. We'll look at the E's a little more in the VHF section. Uh, Back to HF right now, and the solar flux level dropped below 70 last week as a result of sunspot number 2738 rotating off the visible disk. Sunspot 2739 never really amounted to much, and since then the solar disk has been a little bit bare. One bit of news is that the cosmic ray flux has been increasing, and this is expected as we head towards solar minimum. Solar activity will remain very low unless a sunspot crops up unannounced. A small coronal hole may cause some disruption on Friday or Saturday over the weekend, just in time for International Marconi Day. HF conditions remain pretty challenging, with even 20 metres not fully opening until later in the morning. NOAA predicts the solar flux index will remain at around 60 to 70 this week, thanks to the spotless sun. And geomagnetic conditions will be unsettled on Saturday the 27th, as we said, and again on the 30th, the 1st and the 2nd of May, when the KP index may rise to 4. Moving back to the VHF and upwards propagation news now, we have a low pressure feel for many areas at first, so this spell of showery weather continues to provide a choice of rain scatter on the gigahertz bands. The high pressure is only temporarily displaced, so as it rebuilds, the north of Scotland is one model and to the south of Britain is another. There is clearly scope for changes to the forecast as the week progresses, but either way it does suggest that we may be able to talk of some tropo returning in the second half of next week. 
that sporadic e season is upon us and it has been for some time using on digital modes and on wednesday evening the six meter band gave a brief opening from the uk to spain and the balearics on ssb and cw this seemed to tie in with a strong jet stream over the pyrenees from the first of may the daily ease blog will restart on propquest.co.uk to give you some ideas as to where to find these useful jet streams the forecast jet stream charts at the moment suggest that this region may migrate eastwards to affect the Alps before weakening and therefore paths towards Italy and the Balkans may be activated in the first part of the week. After the excitement of the Lyrids meteor shower, this coming week will be a little slower. The Eta Aquarids shower will peak on the 5th of May, but there are meteors associated with the shower from around the 19th of April, so expect to see bursts and pings all this week. The moon will continue to wane this week, with the new moon appearing on the 5th of May. Liberation will be at the minimum, but path losses will be quite high, with the moon coming off Apogee, which is the furthest distance from Earth, at the start of the week. The moon will rise in the very early morning, at the beginning of the week and with the low declination it'll set quite early too as the week progresses the moon will set later in the day making the later part of the week probably best for casual eme activity and that's it from the propagation team for another week and that is it for your gb2rs national news for the uk from around the world this week don't forget your regional gb2rs news will be on the air over the weekend all you've got to do is track down your local newsreader who's on the air close by to you might be on hf might be on two meters might be on six meters could be on 70 centimeters if you're not sure where to find your local newsreader head over to the tx factor website at txfactor.co.uk on the home page there is a gb2rs news tab click on that and you can download a pdf file with details and names and call signs of all the broadcasters who are on the air reading the regional GB2RS and it'll tell you which band they're on too so go check that out and you'll find out all about your local GB2RS news that's it I'm Mike Marsh G1IR reporting with the TX News weekly podcast of GB2RS good DX73 thanks for listening we'll see you back here next week with the very latest edition of GB2RS news Foundations of Amateur Radio. If you've been around the hobby in the past decade, you may have come across the invention of a software defined radio, or SDR. You might even own one, and if you've looked into how it works, read the explanation that essentially describes it as a traditional radio where all the components are implemented in software. To me, that's like explaining how a radio works by waving your hands and saying, Here is magic. How it actually works is something altogether more interesting and thought-provoking. If you think of sound, like my voice, coming from a speaker, you can imagine putting a voltmeter on the speaker terminals and measuring every second what the voltage is. As my voice gets louder, you might measure a large voltage. As I take a breath, it will be smaller. You could chart the different measurements and show a waveform that would represent the loud and soft parts of what I'm saying. The faster you measure, the more accurate the picture represents my voice. For comparison, a CD player does this measurement 44,000 times per second. If you were to play back those sound measurements at the same rate into a speaker, you'd end up with my voice. And that's actually more or less what's happening if you're listening to this podcast. Yes, for the purists, there's more to it, but not relevant at this point. Similarly, if you were to hook up a voltmeter to an antenna and take measurements, you'd end up with a chart that represented the signal strength that your antenna is receiving. And the faster you measured, the better the representation. What it exactly represents, I'll come to in a moment. The waveform that represents my voice is actually a very complex signal. In much the same way as a piece of music is made up of different notes, played in sequence and in concert with each other, my voice is also made up of separate frequencies, played together to form the words that you hear. If you were to measure those separate frequencies and draw a waveform for each, 
you'd see how every one contributes a little to the overall effect. And, if you were to add them all together, you'd have my voice again. In the same way, the waveform that represents an antenna signal is made up of all the separate frequencies that go into the overall signal. You might be surprised to learn that an antenna is actually hearing all frequencies at the same time. Some better than others, but typically all of the RF spectrum at any given time. Your radio is also essentially hearing all frequencies. When you tune to a local station on 720 kHz, you're actually telling your radio to ignore all the stuff that isn't 720 kHz and to only process that small bit of what it's hearing. The selectivity of a radio is the measurement that represents how good your radio is at being deaf to all the things you don't want to hear. To help that filtering, a traditional radio and antenna works by pre-selecting part of the RF spectrum. When you press the AM button on your car radio, you're selecting which chunk to listen to. Press the FM button on the same car radio, you'll select another chunk. On an amateur radio, you select by choosing the 80 meter band, the 40 meter band, etc. Similarly, your antenna is predisposed to hearing a particular chunk better than others, but that doesn't make it immune to signals across the entire range. You may have heard described that a software-defined radio hears all frequencies at the same time. Essentially, it's a voltmeter connected to your antenna, spitting out measurements as fast as it can for processing by a computer. The waveform that comes from those antenna voltage measurements represents all of the RF spectrum, and it's just the beginning of what you can do next. In the same way that my voice is made up of lots of different parts, all played together, the RF spectrum is made up of the local broadcast stations, the local TV stations, mobile phones, garage remotes, Roy on the 7130 DXNet, this podcast on your local repeater, all at the same time, all played together, to make the waveform that represents the measurements you make at the base of an antenna. I'm going to ignore for a moment how exactly we extract the various bits, or how we decode an FM or SSB signal using software. It involves some math. Instead, we can look at something that is easier to explain. Unlike with a traditional radio, which has to work hard to filter out undesirable information, a software-defined radio can filter out information by just deleting those measurements you're not interested in. Yes, there is more to it much more, but that's the beginnings of how an SDR works. If you'd like to get in touch, please do. CQ at VK6FLAB.com. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. This is ARRL Audio News, your weekly summary of news highlights from the world of amateur radio. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, and these are our stories for Friday, April 26th. ARRL and the FCC have signed a Memorandum of Understanding that paves the way to implement the new and enhanced Volunteer Monitor Program. The Memorandum establishes the Volunteer Monitors as a replacement for the Official Observers Program. Current Official Observers have been encouraged to participate in the new program. We are excited by the opportunity to codify our partnership with the FCC and to work together to achieve our mutual interests of protecting the integrity of our amateur radio bands, said ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR. The Memorandum of Understanding will serve as the foundation for a new level of partnership on this very important issue. ARRL has contracted with retired FCC Special Counsel and former Atlantic Division Vice Director Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, to oversee the ARRL's role in the development and implementation of the new Volunteer Monitor Program. Approved by the ARRL Board of Directors at its July 2018 meeting, the new Volunteer Monitor Program is a formal agreement between the FCC and ARRL in which volunteers trained and vetted by the ARRL will monitor the airwaves and collect evidence that can be both used to correct misconduct or recognize exemplary on-air operation. Cases of flagrant violations will be referred to the FCC by the ARRL for action in accordance with FCC guidelines. 
The intent of this program is to re-energize enforcement efforts in the amateur radio bands. It was proposed by the FCC in the wake of several FCC regional office closures and a reduction in field staff. Hollingsworth has identified three phases to the program, development, solicitation and training, and implementation. Hollingsworth has committed to FCC and ARRL officials to ensure the adequacy of training for the new positions, to review the quality and utility of volunteer monitor submissions to the FCC for enforcement actions, and to advocate for rapid disposition of cases appropriately submitted to the FCC. ARRL officials estimate that within six to nine months, the first volunteer monitors will be in place and ready to begin their duties. With an eye toward helping new and inexperienced hams enjoy the full range of activities that Amateur Radio has to offer, Hamvention and the ARRL 2019 National Convention will embrace the theme of mentoring the next generation. Hamvention hosts the National Convention May 17th through 19th at the Green County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. This will mark the third year from Hamvention at its new venue. A contingent of ARRL staff and member volunteers will join forces to make available many ARRL exhibits and resources to Hamvention visitors. The centerpiece of ARRL's participation will be ARRL Expo in Building 2. An extensive roster of exhibits and activities will also educate and entertain. Instructors from the ARRL Teachers Institute for Wireless Technology will be on hand to bring wireless and electronics theory to life in hands-on demonstrations and lessons. They'll also touch on satellite communications, microcontrollers, and the fundamentals of robotics. At a Sunday morning forum called Discovering Radio Communications, presenters for the Teachers Institute will highlight a variety of instructional experiences and ideas. As part of its mentoring focus, ARRL has invited members of the Nashua, New Hampshire Area Radio Society, or NARS, to Hamvention and ARRL Expo to share the club's effective and well-developed outreach program. The ARRL Special Service Club, which boasts more than 200 members and is being recognized as the 2019 Hamvention Club of the Year, caters to radio amateurs of all interests and experience levels. NARS will host an interactive exhibit that may serve as a model for other radio clubs to emulate, as well as a Friday midday forum. Club members will discuss their activities and approach to building membership and club participation. A new, speedier, more contest-friendly digital mode is just days away, at least in its beta form. WSJTX developers say serious work on the new FT4 protocol began shortly after the FT8 roundup held last December. FT4 is an experimental digital mode designed specifically for radio contesting that, like FT8, uses fixed-length transmissions, structured messages with formats optimized for minimal contacts, and strong forward error correction. Transmit-receive sequences are 6 seconds, making it 2.5 times faster than FT8 and about the same speed as conventional ready for radio contesting. FT4 can work with signals 10 dB weaker than would be required to decode RIDI while using much less bandwidth. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. March 3rd, mark the 50th anniversary of AMSAT. We have created a very special AMSAT journal for the 50th anniversary, and we would like to share it with you. You do not need to be a member of AMSAT, although we would appreciate it if you would join. The downloadable PDF is available from the main page at AMSAT.org. We hope that you enjoy going back in time and reading of our history and seeing where we are going. Nepal will be launching their first satellite later this year. It will be a 1U CubeSat and be called NepaliSat-1. Sri Lanka will also have a satellite on the same launch. It is Ravana-1. And guess what? Japan will have a satellite as well, also one new CubeSat named Uguisu. All three satellites will share the same downlink, 437.375 MHz, which is a 9K6 GMSK telemetry, as well as a CW beacon. The main mission is for the three to provide ciphered short messages in their beacons. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, for the ARRL Audio News. This is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, April 26th. We've returned to a featureless sun, so the solar flux index has dropped to 69. 
As you might expect, this translates to generally poor conditions on the higher HF bands, but 160 through 40 meters may provide some surprises. Of course, we're getting into thunderstorm season these days, so static crashes could be a hassle on 160 and 80 meters in particular. On VHF and UHF, significant band openings have been occurring on 2 meters and above in southern parts of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And as we approach the end of April, keep an eye on 6 meters, since this marks the beginning of sporadic E season. And that concludes ARRL Audio News for this week. Our thanks to all contributors to this week's report. ARRL Audio News is produced by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. For more information on amateur radio or the ARRL, visit us on the web at ARRL.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for ARRL. If you have a question or comment about ARRL Audio News, email us at audionews at ARRL.org. This program is copyright ARRL, all rights reserved. 73, and thanks for listening. This is The Doctor Is In, your bi weekly podcast that discusses all things technical and not so technical. The Doctor Is In podcast is produced by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and sponsored by DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. See their website at www.dxengineering.com. And now, here's your host, QST editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and the doctor himself, Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hello and welcome to The Doctor Is In. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY. And I'm Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Joel, let's talk about handheld transceivers. I'm sure you own dozens, probably. I don't, don't know you? how many. They just Every time I open a drawer, I find another one. <laughs> Well, you know, they've been around in ham circles since the beginning of the grand FM craze, which right. was uh, roughly, I think the first amateur radio handhelds came into being sometime around the early 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's my recollection. And now they're just huge. Everybody, yeah. or virtually everybody owns one, right? I think that's true. <laughs> it's the seabed. I mean, I remember two-meter handhelds were the, the commonplace item, yep. but of course now you're, you know, you're hardly fashionable if you don't have a at least a dual band if not a tri-band right transceiver handheld transceiver some of them even do hf for some reason well <laughs> they or at least listen down there but if we're talking to somebody who maybe does not own one what sort of features should one uh, look for well that's a good question and i think typically these days the first transceiver most hams get is a vhf or vhf uhf handheld that seems to be the trend at least around here the yeah the clubs, technician licensee sure yeah the clubs um, tend to focus around public service and other kinds of uh, community activities that, that sort of lean towards that kind of operation. So if you have a handheld, you can participate in the road rally and check people off as they go by or whatever. And that, that tends to be where people start. Unfortunately, a lot of people stop there, which is too bad, but, but, uh, but that's where people start. As you mentioned, for years, the standard was 2-meter FM using analog modulation. That was right. that was what they did. And in many areas, that is still the most common kind of situation. It is still the most common VHF, UHF mode, yes. I think that's true. Now, added uh, some years later were CTCSS, or private line tone generation on transmit, which allowed you to access the repeater station that you wanted rather than all of the repeaters on that frequency in the area, which used to make people yes. crazy. And that is now almost always universally available on amateur equipment. And I wouldn't consider getting a FM two-meter handheld that didn't have a private line or, or CTCSS Oh, absolutely encoding. not, no. It's just almost useless. Um, I have a couple of them, but I use them mainly for within-the-house intercoms or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or car-to-car. Thing. Another thing that used to be popular on uh, FM handhelds, but is not so much anymore, is... Uh, Having a touch tone pad that would allow sending out dual frequency tones that telephones use for dialing. They were used primarily for this uh, auto patch function that repeaters had, in which they had a, a device adjacent to the repeater connected to phone lines. And if you accessed it with the right coding, 
you could bring up a dial tone and make typically a local call from your repeater for connecting to something off the network. So you could, uh, again, you couldn't order a pizza because that was commercial, but you could call your spouse and say, I'm, I'm on my way home from the meeting and I'll be 10 minutes late or two hours late, whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's very handy and good for emergency use, too. You could call the police, call uh, any emergency services. The touchstones were also useful for uh, controlling devices. Yes, they still are. And and uh, in many cases, the repeater control operator uses those same touchstones to um, cause functions to happen in the repeater. So you can, uh, if there's something going awry with the repeater, if you can, if it's not transmitting steadily, if it's, uh, so you can get into it, you can uh, shut it down or you can cause it to change power level, whatever needs to be done. Or you can turn off the PL tone if you need to have wide open access for some emergency or whatever, so that it can be handy. In fact, uh, it used to be there were all kinds of functions that people did. You could um, get the repeater to tell you whether you were on frequency or not. That's right, yes. <laughs> all, I don't yes. think people do that anymore, but it used to be all kinds of fancy things that people would build into the repeaters. Well, especially now that those touchstone pads are vanishing off of most handhelds. Yeah, you don't see them. And I, you know, it's kind of too bad. I guess uh, I'm not a great cell phone fan and I kind of miss having the <laughs> auto patch. But anyway, so you don't, you know, you don't need that anymore for most folks, um, but it doesn't hurt to have it on there. No. And some analog handholds off, also offer um, built-in APRS. Now that can be... Uh, added on to a separate yes. set of equipment, but it's kind of handy to have that and can support some kinds of emergency communication, assuming that other people have appropriate equipment. And to do that, it has to have a global positioning system receiver built into it, of course. A number of handhelds do. It was kind of a rarity a few years ago, but it's becoming a little more common, at least among the yeah. higher end, right. uh, more expensive handhelds. Yeah. So you know where you are. That's always yes, pretty handy. That's always helpful. But for me, memories are critical and how many memories and how I can sort them and so on. I have trouble remembering what's in what memory. And, uh, but anyway, I, I must admit, <laughs> I don't use, use it that often. But, um, but I think the biggest change in the past decade or so has been the profusion of digital mo modulation schemes. Yes. And that's kind of changed the whole structure of um, VHF handhelds. The early amateur providers started with ICOM offering radios using the Japanese standard D-Star system which provided digital voice operation as well as network data communication using special repeaters. Yes. And the problem with that, or a problem with that is, uh, in many areas, repeater pairs are li very limited. And what that meant was, if you're going to put in a D-Star repeater, which wouldn't support, doesn't support analog <laughs> FM, you had to take down a repeater that did support analog FM. So somebody with a regular old uh, analog handheld couldn't get through a re that repeater anymore and put up the, the D-Star. But it had a lot of advantages. This uh, provided digital voice operation as well as network data communication. And the repeaters were a special type that could handle this. And they were could be networked over the phone system or other in other ways between uh, the repeaters. And uh, they had a lot of capability there. In addition, all D-Star transceivers that I ever encountered also supported standard analog FM. So that yes. meant they were backward compatible. That's true. And now Kenwood also provides transceivers and repeaters that use D-Star. I don't know if anybody else does. No, it's uh, Kenwood with that, that one um, particular model and then, of course, all the ICOM D-Star units. And not too long ago, Yesu entered the market with its own proprietary digital voice and data system called C4. FM, or as they it, call it, System Fusion, yes. yes. Which is another digital system that is, has similar features to D-Star, but is not compatible with it. And then to this has been added a number of systems designed for commercial users, but now popular with amateurs as surplus early equipment has become available at low cost. Some manufacturers in the Far East also make compatible equipment that can support amateur as well as commercial users. Uh, some of the popular systems are APCO P25, a uh, trunked public safety digital-only system that includes products offered by multiple manufacturers. Another digital system that has become very popular is digital mobile radio. Oh, yeah, DMR. DMR, yeah. a standard system that is similar but not compatible with the other systems. So, so we well, have three primarily, if you don't count P25, we have three digital systems that you might find in handheld transceivers that are all incompatible with each other. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's a kind of a, uh, not a great, I mean, one of the things about ham radio is you'd like to be able to talk to other hams. Yes. So you have to say, well, see, what kind of system are you on? Well, I can't talk to you. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you can always shift back to analog, but 
uh, if you want to participate in what's going on in some kind of a group, you need to be able to have the kind of equipment that uh, that they use. True. Uh, now, why move to digital? If if signals are strong, digital voice will generally have a higher signal to noise ratio than FM. But if FM is strong, it has a high signal to noise ratio anyway in yes. terms of voice. So um, what's the deal? But anyway, while FM gets noisy, it gets weaker. Digital stays about the same until it reaches a threshold, at which point it suddenly is no longer useful at all. It goes kerchunk and it's just um, garbage. Whereas FM can usually still function at that point. Yes. So it's more gradual rollout, roll off. And of course, the, the digital radios, in addition to voice, carry data channels, call signs, what have you, that are going separately. And they can send data much more efficiently than analog oh, yeah. systems with modems and so forth. So so digital systems have their advantages, but um, the big disadvantage in my view is the fact that they're not compatible with each other and, and uh, you have your own little island of, of uh, some particular modulation. That's true. So how to pick a, a, a handheld? Well, the answer is simple. Go with whatever your local group has settled on. Yes. No matter how much or how many whiz-bang features your favorite digital mode offers, if yours is the only radio of that type in the area, you end up only being able to talk to yourself. That's, or your buddy that happened to buy the same radio. That's yeah, right, yeah. He made the same mistake. So your local club or public service group has probably put up a repeater to support the mode of choice, whether it's analog yes. or it's a um, one of the digital modes. That's usually the case. And if, if that's the case, you know, get involved with the club. And if it's a club you want to be doing things with, you probably want to uh, get the kind of radio that works with their repeater. There will always still be a place for FM transceivers, so don't toss them, but line up with what your group is doing when you go to f towards a digital transceiver. Absolutely. Well, let's take a break, Joel, and we will hear from DX Engineering, and we will be back. Ever talk to a salesperson who didn't know the difference between a rotator and a rotary phone, or a Yagi and a yo-yo, or a ballon and a ballerina? You'll never have that problem with DX Engineering. When you call us, you'll talk directly with knowledgeable amateur radio experts, people who speak your language. When you contact DX Engineering, you're dealing with operators who are as passionate about the hobby as you are. This means better service, expert technical advice, and a commitment to your complete satisfaction, even long after your purchase has been made. Whether you're newly licensed or a long-time operator, you'll always find a friendly ham who understands exactly what you need on the other end of the line. Plus, you'll find a huge selection of amateur radio equipment, get the fastest shipping in the ham universe, and shipping is free on most orders over $99. Let's talk about your station. Visit us at dxengineering.com. That's dxengineering.com. And we're back, Joel, and I have an interesting question for you. This one comes from Mark WF9Y, and he's asking, One of my antennas is a G5RV dipole. A ham up in Canada recommended I put a bunch of ground radials beneath it. The more the better. He said that... He did it, and it helps his performance. I've never heard of this before. What have you? What are your thoughts? I've never heard of this either, frankly. Uh, I'm going to be curious to see what you have to say. Well, about yeah, I guess um, it's interesting because I think what it comes from is uh, many antenna publications show antenna patterns of antennas over uh, perfect ground and antennas over less perfect ground and so forth. So you say, oh, well, uh, I want an antenna over perfect ground, so it looks like that pattern. Well, by putting ground radials underneath it, you kind of are approaching that. Um, but the question is, is that what you really want? And it depends very much on what your needs are. Uh, it certainly will, will increase the ground conductivity beneath your antenna if you add radials. And this may help or may be an issue depending on your objectives. An improved ground beneath and connected to a vertical monopole does improve the efficiency by getting more power into the antenna. Oh, no question. Uh, but of course, in this case, we're talking about a Presumably a horizontal <laughs> yeah. dipole. A horizontal antenna. Uh, with a horizontal antenna, such as your G5RV, what will happen is that signals will be tended will tend to be reflected upward, which, if your antenna is less than a half wavelength high, will be good for short range or medium range um, near vertical incident sky wave propagation. Okay, which can be you know that's that's yeah. very important for a yeah. lot of people, and uh, this will improve your regional communication. Uh, 
not by a lot, but by a little, especially on 80 and 40 meters. But the other side of that coin is it will reduce the power available for lower angle, long distance communication. That's what I thought. So it yeah. depends on what your objectives are. If you want to work DX, you don't want to do that unless no. your antenna is very high. And actually, it won't even matter for that because for DX, low angle radiation, you don't need the ground enhanced below the antenna. You need it some hundred feet away or something for the low to support the low angle radiation. So I can take a big sheet of metal and put it a hundred feet from my antenna and that will improve it, huh? In that direction. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would ever seriously do such a thing. I've been involved in programs like we had a, uh, I worked on an HF over the horizon radar system at one point um, for one of our government agencies. And, and uh, we had a ground screen that extended out 800 feet in front of the antenna. Wow. for that purpose, to support low-angle radiation. That happened to have been a vertical antenna, but the same thing would have worked for, would have worked for a horizontal as well. And um, My wife wouldn't permit that. No, and probably some of your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Which, not like having a, a wire mesh over the house. Lots of chicken wire, yes. Yes. So that, that can be done. It has been done. It takes a lot of money to do that if you figure out how much wire that takes. But you can get a sense of how this all works by looking at those radiation patterns in those books where you have one that shows the radiation over a perfect ground. Look at a low horizontal antenna and you'll see the radiation going mostly up. Then you look at a pattern for the same antenna over free space and you'll see that the elevation is equal at all elevation angles. Now, of course, um, even a real crummy ground is not quite that... Uh, you're not going to penetrate the earth and go towards the center of the earth. No. So, so the radiation going straight down is not going to go there. But but you see that the there's a lot more radiation going off at low angles in that case than there is um, the case with a perfect ground under it. Now, the radiation at the low angles will not be as strong as it will be when it's reflected upwards where you get the benefit of the reflected wave. But nonetheless, the radiation at low angles over uh, free space will be higher than it will be for a low horizontal antenna over a perfect ground. So that's kind of what you're up against. Yes. So the real situation that you have will be sort of in between. And one thing you can do is you can go to take a trip to your town engineer's office and he might be able to give you some ground connectivity information about what the connectivity is in your area. And then some simple antenna modeling can show you exactly what happens in your situation. And you can uh, actually try putting the radials in the model and see what happens. Now, most antenna modeling programs will not allow you to put radials underground. There are some exceptions, but they tend to be quite expensive. On the other hand, if you model the radials a few inches above ground, programs can handle that, and that'll be very similar to what the performance you get from having a buried radial. So you can actually find out what it will do for your situation. That would and, be helpful. And decide whether it makes sense for you. So if you if you want near vertical incident sky wave, that will help a little. And if you want DX, it will hurt a little. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's basically it. Well, thank you, Joel. My pleasure. If you have a question for the doctor, email us at doctor at ARRL.org. The Doctor is in podcast is sponsored by DX Engineering at www.dxengineering.com. Background music provided by Purple Planet at www.purple-planet.com. This podcast is copyright ARRL. All rights are reserved. Until next time, I'm QST Managing Editor Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY73, and thanks for listening. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x, xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.a0ete.nl. Abonneer je nu gratis op de podcast van de Daily Minutes. De website van de podcast is dmpodcast.net. DM is kort voor Daily Minutes, dus dmpodcast.net. Bij de feed van de podcast komen er nog een breukstreep en vier letters bij. Breukstreep F-E-E-D. dmpodcast.net, schuine streep F-E-E-D. Subscribe now for this podcast, dmpodcast.net slash feed. dmpodcast.net slash feed. DM is Delta Mike. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshopnl Whoever hears this is crazy. En microfoon naar retour.